Thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, let me bring this back to uh, what we already discussed this morning to a certain part. Um, a, a, a huge sort of essential idea behind this entire project was Cedric Price's idea to think of a new kind of an institution. And um, we are picking this up, trying to not, yeah, as he and, 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 uh, Ludwig, and Lucius Bukas also did, to not think this institution primarily from the perspective of architecture, but more from the perspective of processes, of interactions, of the experience people make, of the way art and life are interconnected as they were in this wonderful coloring project that we just heard so much about. So the idea is very much about creating something like a richer kind of a ritual, yeah, than the, the usual uh, than, than, than the usual exhibition format or ritual that we know about. So um, what I would like to speak about now is a, is a text that we actually published in this little blue uh, brochure. Um, maybe you can open it already if you have it here. It's on page 22. It's an ex essay by Margaret, or an excerpt of an essay by Margaret Mead, a cultural anthropologist. But let me say a few words before uh, I begin reading this to you. Just why, like where this idea of a richer ritual comes from and what it strives against. What it basically strives against is the core idea of the exhibition format, which is very much based on an idea of separation. Yeah? The exhibited, like historically, structurally, the exhibited object has always been an object that is exhibited, extracted, displaced from a previous context. Like think of, think of the altar painting in a church that is taken out of this church to be integrated into the museum. Think of the portrait of a prince that is taken out of the decorative system of a palace to be integrated into the museum. So in both cases, the idea of putting things on display is preceded by an act of separation, of a moment of division, which not only marks the core of the exhibition format, but also the core of a modern thinking. So this is very much linked to this idea of modernity, yeah? in which the, the a gesture and act and thinking in terms of separating things, of divisioning things is crucial, yeah? very fundamental. Um, as an attitude that in modernity was extremely productive, yeah? economically, um, it led to massive increases in productivity because humans, only, only, only when humans can separate it separate themselves from the world. They can learn to use the world as human, as, 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 as their resource. Huh? So, as a kind of repository of resources. So, um, economically it was highly productive. Politically, it was emancipatory in the sense of rupturing, breaking with the rigid structures of feudal societies because the, mo the moment in which the altar painting leaves the altar in a way exemplifies a break, or the modern individual that leaves the rigid structures of feudal society. So the one stands for the other. So in a, moment, in, a, in a way one could say this moment where the altar painting leaves the altars keep, carries in it the entire uh, paradigm of modernity. And in terms of the history idea of ideas, it proved extremely... Um, it, drove, it drove us to an modern, enlightened, rational thinking. Huh? integrated in the church, the altar painting is part of a closed religious cosmology. In the museum it becomes part of a modern, rational, more open cosmology. Yeah? Okay, so that's, that's why this idea of separation as the core concept of the exhibition is so fundamental. And that's why museums became so, such important institutions because they cultivate the fundamental idea of modernity in a way. Yeah? They create a, an entire ritual around it. From today's perspective, however, and this now leads me to market meat, um, from today's perspective, however, being confronted with the economic and, and social and ecological consequences of this uh, gesture, of this imperative of separation, the limitation of this, the, the, the limits of this attitude become more and more um, evident. Huh? So the question today seems to be, or the question that becomes more and more urgent seems to be, how everything that has been separated, nature from culture, product from processes, humans, human individuals from social processes, um, 
rationality from other forms of knowledge or thinking, huh? how all this that has been separated can be brought back together. So in other words, how to think modalities of interrelatedness and associations rather than modalities of separation and division. And here, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm very much referring to, uh, to Cedric Price and Lucius Burkhardt also, who were very early proponents of such a thinking in interrelations and associations and in networks. Yet when it comes to uh, thinking of modalities of connection, the exhibition format clearly reaches limits, huh? reaches limits that are structural, because as I said, a format that is geared towards, and I said this this morning already, a format that has historically been um, uh, created um, in order to break up uh, ties, um, can only to a certain extent produce connectivity or ties or bonds huh? or modalities of connecting and being connected. So, approaching the idea of a new Western ritual, I think it's worth rereading this text of the anthropologist Margaret Mead. You find it on page 22, uh, I think. Um, it's entitled Art and Reality from the Standpoint of Cultural Anthropology. She published it in 1943 and, and, and it articulates a fierce attack on the modern concept of art and the exhibition. So let me read you some excerpts. The study of primitive cultures, themselves highly integrated wholes, which satisfy aesthetic as well as analytical scientific impulses, throws most light upon the problem of the relation of art to present day societies. In the close interrelationships between a phrase of a Balinese music, the design on a Balinese frieze, or the pattern on the border of a cloth, we find a clue to the relationship between art and reality for which our own culture is striving to find new formulations. First, the art of a primitive culture, seen now as the whole ritual, the symbolic expression of the meaning of life, appeals to, and this is very important for her, all the senses. Just as also a medieval high mass involved all the senses, through the eye and ear, to the smell of incense, the kinesthesia of genuflection and kneeling or swaying, to the passing procession, to the cool touch of holy water on the forehead. For art to be reality, the whole sensuous being must be caught up in the experience. That's another sort of key sentence of this text. Our present practices, by which people sit on stiff chairs and listen in constrained silence to a piece of music, or wander in desultory, unpatterned groups in an art gallery, looking at framed pictures, hang in desperate disregard of any relevance which might exist upon them, among them, is the very opposite process. One sense may be heightened, one emotion sharpened, but except in very rare cases, there is no increase in the whole individual's relationship to the whole of life. Second, in primitive societies, the artist is not a separate person, having no immediate close relationship to the economic processes and everyday experiences of his society. The artist instead is the person who does best something that other people, many other people, do less well. His products, whether he be choreographer or dancer, flutist or pot maker, or carver of the temple gate, are seen as differing in degree, but not in kind from the achievements of the less, sorry, of the less gifted uh, among his fellow citizens. The concept of the artist as different in kind is fatal to the development of any adequate artistic form which will satisfy all of the sensibilities which are developed in individuals reared under the impact of these forms. Both of these differences, the difference between a ritual which involves all the senses and our present artistic practices which fractionate the sensuous man, and the difference between an artist who is merely the best of a host of fellow practitioners and the artist who is different in kind from man, who are hardly his fellows at all, are not inherent in the nature of civilization as compared with the nature of primitive society. So, now the final sentence. Our own Middle Ages, as well as many great cultures of the past, developed complete harmonious rituals 
which involved every type of sense experience. And the concept of the artist and the related concept of the fine arts are both special bad accidents of our own local European tradition. So that's Margaret Mead. Why am I reading this to you? Not because I want to sort of promote a return to the Middle Ages or to medieval church masses or something. So in any case, to a pre-modern culture. But what she, what she asks for, a ritual that addresses the, the entire being, the being as a whole, that addresses all the senses, rationality, but also the being as an embodied, as a transcendent, as a spiritual be, uh, being, is sort of categorically oppo opposed to what the exhibition uh, historically emerged to cultivate. Huh? Exhibitions uh, emerged as a ritual that, as I said, cultivate facilities upon which a modern Western thinking and culture is based. Huh? Visuality, rationality, reflection and judgment. And in terms of the rise of modernity, this was an achievement and and an important achievement, one could say, because it was extremely productive in many ways. But, and this is what, what she shows us, there is a price that comes with that. Because huh? many things are excluded, many things are left out. Apart from the eyes, all other senses are excluded, for instance, huh? or at least not specifically addressed or cultivated. Touch, smell, many other, I mean, energies, huh? aside from rationality or critical judgment are just not cultivated, are not sensibilized. So, um, I think it's important to keep this in mind when we think about a new, a richer kind of ritual, huh? because, as I said, the structure of the exhibition has brought us very far. Huh? It has been an extremely important and, and, uh, and a significant ritual, in a way, to shape a modern style of thinking. But in a certain way, now that we have reached all this, one can return to think about all that, this that has been excluded. Huh? And this is, this is sort of the starting point to develop a, a new, uh, a, a richer kind of a ritual that is more complex, that integrates and addresses more aspects of the human being, different kind of energy, spiritualities, and so on. And that is more focused on people than on objects. So the question is how, from the perspective that we have here now, so from the perspective of a Western, rationalized, industrialized, uh, modernized thinking, this idea of being in touch with the wholeness of being can be integrated. Huh? So how we can sort of include market meat in, in, in the idea of the exhibition ritual. And this is why the Fun Palace is interesting for us, because the Fun Palace, out of all attempts to reconfigure the museum or to reconfigure the exhibition, the Fun Palace is one of the examples that certainly goes the furthest or is an attempt, articulates an attempt in that direction, in integrating different modalities of addressing people, interweaving different traditions, the exhibition, the event, the the forms of communication and so on. So as an attempt, so what we do is in a certain in a sense we, we use the Fun Palace as an impulse, as a reference to develop something uh, in that direction. So to develop a, a ritual, a cultural format that tries to conceive of uh, the entire sensuous being in a way. Thank you. That's it for now. I'll, I'll be back in a few hours for the third part.